¿Cuál es la estrategia más efectiva para terminar con una dictadura sangrienta y establecer la democracia, una revolución violenta o la resistencia civil? El fracaso de la Revolución Sandinista, que derrocó a la dictadura de Somoza en 1979, nos enseñó en carne propia a varias generaciones nicaragüenses cuál es el camino equivocado. Y desde abril de 2018, una mayoría política azul y blanco está empeñada en salir de una nueva dictadura a través de métodos pacíficos. La experiencia histórica mundial pareciera indicar que este es el camino correcto, pero no está exento de riesgos, de tropiezos y también de posibilidades de fracaso. Y para conocer más a fondo qué es la resistencia civil, cómo se organiza, de qué depende su éxito y también cuáles son las principales causas de sus fracasos, conversamos con la politóloga Erika Chenoweth, investigadora de la Universidad de Harvard, quien es una de las principales expertas en el debate internacional sobre este tema. La profesora Chenoweth es coautora con María Stefan del libro Why Civil Resistance Works, ¿Por qué es exitosa la resistencia civil? En el que compararon los resultados políticos de 200 intentos de revoluciones violentas y 100 campañas de resistencia no violenta en distintos países del mundo durante el siglo XX. Su conclusión, basada en la experiencia histórica empírica, es categórica a favor de la resistencia no violenta. Veamos lo que nos dijo en la siguiente entrevista. Profesora Chenoweth, su libro se basa en una investigación que compara los resultados políticos de las revoluciones violentas con los de movimientos de resistencia civil en muchos países. ¿Cuáles son las conclusiones? The main conclusions are that from 1900 to 2006, movements that relied overwhelmingly on nonviolent resistance were more likely to succeed, basically creating democratic breakthroughs or uh, creating independent territories through secession or self-determination than movements that used violent revolutionary tactics. And uh, in addition to that, Um, Maria, Stefan, and I found that um, the reason was because nonviolent movements tend to be much larger and more inclusive of many different sectors of the society than armed revolutions, which tend to be fairly um, uh, small scale in terms of active participation uh, and tend not to involve as many people from across a society. Pero ¿cómo pueden ser exitosos los movimientos de resistencia civil cuando se enfrentan con una dictadura brutal que usa la fuerza y la represión con armas? ¿Cuáles son los factores clave de su éxito? Uh, there are a few different key factors. Um, the first is that uh, nonviolent movements are more likely than violent movements to experience a backfiring dynamic when they do face brutal repression. This means that um, uh, Across the world, it's a general pattern that brutal force against unarmed people tends to result in defections from security forces and non-cooperation um, by those that are engaging in repression because they don't see such repression as justified or in their own personal interests. It can also be the case that, um, that such defections happen even before repression Uh, really escalates to a, a large extent. In fact, most nonviolent campaigns experience much lower intensities of repression than armed campaigns, which actually creates very widespread repressive responses from the state. Ahora, pero no todos los movimientos de resistencia civil son exitosos. Hay muchos ejemplos de respuestas represivas que se imponen a medida que las protestas masivas fracasan en el intento de producir cambios políticos. ¿Cuáles son las principales razones de estos fracasos? I think the main reason is that um, the state was able to divide and rule the movement more effectively than the movement was able to divide and rule the state. So um, civil resistance techniques are fundamentally about um, making the pillars of the state's support begin to stop supporting the state. So economic and business interests, but also Um, security forces, uh, civil servants, and, and public uh, 
servants um, begin to realize that it's not in their interest to continue supporting the state. It's much easier for them to do that when a challenge is based on nonviolent resistance and they recognize that they could have a future in the state. Um, and so um, that is really a, more of a, a, a strategy trying to dislocate and divide the, the regime. Um, and so uh, if the regime actually is better at doing that to the movement by dividing it across different kind of social cleavages, by infiltrating the movement, um, by uh, provoking the movement into resorting to violence or some of the people within the movement, then the regime is much more likely to succeed in the end. ¿Cómo se organiza la resistencia civil? ¿En qué es diferente de la protesta de un movimiento social en general o del pacifismo? Es un movimiento sin líderes nacionales autoconvocados, como decimos en Nicaragua, o funciona como un movimiento organizado, liderado por activistas y cuadros políticos. Civil resistance is different from protest. Protest is one of many thousands of Ta uh, tactics that are available uh, to movements that use civil resistance. But most effective civil resistance campaigns use many different methods like strikes, boycotts, stayaways, go slows, and other forms of mass non cooperation, which are often even more effective than protest alone. And so um, movements that uh, succeed generally uh, around the world uh, were able to coordinate. Uh, and sequence these methods in a way that increased pressure on the regime while also uh, making sure that people weren't constantly exposed to the risk of repression through street demonstrations, for example. And so, yes, that does require a certain level of coordination. It doesn't necessarily require a single leader or charismatic leader or figurehead, but uh, it does tend to uh, require sort of boring, day-to-day -day political organizing, community organizing, coalition building, and uh, coming up with a, a sort of united front, to, so to speak, um, that can cooperate and coordinate these types of methods over time. Pero eso se parece a la forma en que funciona un partido político, como un partido político de cuadro. It is somewhat similar to a political party, um, except that political parties are trying to contest power through institutions. For example, they're trying to build this coalition so that they can run for office um, through elections and uh, essentially uh, take power uh, through constitutional means. Most civil resistance campaigns are, uh, the ones that I study anyway, are operating in systems where such institutional channels are not available to any, any formal opposition party. Uh, and instead, um, uh, most of these movements are using uh, extra constitutional uh, means in order to, um, to create and, and, um, and achieve power. And that doesn't mean that they're um, closed off to things like negotiation. In fact, many of the different campaigns um, in the data set that I'm talking about did hold a series of negotiations with, uh, with members of the opponent regime. Um, but it is to say that the, the movement has to, uh, successful movements have uh, kind of created um, a sense that the, ch the change they were bringing about was inevitable. Uh, and so it was only to the interests of those in the existing regime to participate in negotiations um, to find a, 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 p a peaceful uh, long-term arrangement politically. Si el objetivo de la resistencia civil es derrocar a un régimen autoritario o promover reformas que faciliten una elección libre y competitiva, ¿cómo puede un movimiento de resistencia que no es un partido político y que no está legalmente registrado adaptarse a un proceso electoral? Some movements don't successfully adapt to an electoral process and so um, in these types of situations <clears throat> if a movement succeeds um, but doesn't find a way to organize itself into um, a, a meaningful political party, um, then we've seen counter-revolutions or, um, you know, a kind of resurgence of the, the old status quo. So this is true in the Egyptian case, for example, if you think about 2011 to 2013. Um, the opposition succeeded in forming what we call a negative coalition, meaning Mubarak Go. But they didn't actually then 
um, successfully create a, a, a positive coalition of, of what is going to replace this old system. And so um, the, the military stepped back in two years later. Um, the, you can compare this to Tunisia, where um, in Tunisia, uh, similar timing, similar negative coalition trying to get Ben Ali out of office, but then they spent really three, four, five years in very difficult and painful negotiations um, that were kind of broadly representative of many different sectors of the society in order to hammer out the new constitution and the and and new political parties that were competing. You know, we're cautiously optimistic about the fact that Tunisia has emerged from this total crisis um, in, in a relatively um, peaceful and stable situation. So, um, so I, I think it's very difficult, but um, good faith efforts on, on the part of uh, the opposition uh, and, uh, you know, members of the regime um, can pay off and uh, after some steady commitment. ¿Qué tan amplios y diversos son los movimientos de resistencia civil que han sido exitosos? Son movimientos de unidad nacional. ¿Cómo enfrentan el dilema de incorporar la participación de sectores como los empresarios, por ejemplo, que han sido parte del poder y que le temen a la inestabilidad que asocian con la protesta social y también le temen a participar en una coalición que no controlan completamente. Very difficult problem. Um, and like I said, these types of dilemmas um, historically are usually not negotiated in the streets. Um, but rather are um, uh, kind of dealt with day by day through uh, organizing and, um, and good steady leadership. Uh, so, um, you know, there, there is always a problem with, um, with a diverse coalition becoming unwieldy uh, and potentially becoming co-opted or hijacked by special interests. But this is not an unfamiliar problem. This is, this is just true about all politics. Um, and so um, to the degree to which there can be a coordinated leadership that is accountable uh, to different sectors of the, of the participant base uh, through some kind of um, leadership structure that's a coalition-based or coordination council, uh, the more likely these problems are to be addressed through the campaign. En las distintas experiencias que he estudiado, ¿qué roles han jugado la tecnología y las redes sociales para conectar y organizar a los ciudadanos? ¿Puede el activismo digital compensar o sustituir la movilización social y política directa? I think there was a time when digital activism was compensating for the lack of uh, material or physical organizing space. And that time passed about 10 or 15 years ago. Now I think uh, social media is more or less um, uh, a way to continually divide movements and to... Um, uh, surveil them, uh, to infiltrate them, uh, to um, use misinformation against them, uh, or at least to essentially segment information flows to where there are genuinely two different realities in a deeply divided country. Um, this is something that's happening in the United States, I can speak from our experience to where the effects of social media, intentional or not, um, are to create two different lived realities in this country with very little common ground. Um, and that is, that, that is not a good thing, um, either for uh, democratic progress, for people's well-being, or for uh, the prospects for effective organizing that can, that can bridge these divides. ¿Cómo se adapta la resistencia civil frente a las distintas intensidades de la represión de la dictadura? ¿Puede funcionar la resistencia civil frente a regímenes represivos que están dispuestos a utilizar la fuerza militar letal? Y de manera irrestricta en contra de civiles que están desarmados. Um, about 90% of the cases of nonviolent resistance in my data set did face lethal repression uh, and force from their opponents. About half of them succeeded in the end, even though there was this lethal repression. And sometimes um, the lethal repression is exactly what galvanized mass mobilization and support for these movements. Um, the question is, um, is what are the alternatives? So, um, you know, uh, nobody would ever argue, especially myself, that civil resistance is a risk-free 
proposition. Um, there are always um, uh, uh, threatening power uh, usually results in some casualties. Um, but the question is compared to what? What are the other alternative methods of trying to seek social and political change? And um, we know from, from you know, historical cases of armed revolution, for example, that the cost to human life is so much higher um, than in almost any uh, civil resistance campaign. I think, I think the, um, the average civil resistance campaign suffers something like 22 times fewer deaths per year than the average armed insurgency. And so, you know, if, if, if a person thinks about it that way, then, um, you know, it's a, a less costly uh, method, but not a costless method. Pero incluso las dictaduras más impopulares siempre tienen una cuota de apoyo de una base política y tienen la ventaja adicional de controlar el Estado, el partido y el aparato represivo. ¿Hasta dónde puede mantenerse una dictadura sin colapsar? We don't know, and it's different in every case, depending on the type of dictatorship, depending on the level of loyalty um, that uh, the particular leader has from various arms of the state and various other sectors of society that support the state. So uh, we don't know. Um, but one thing I can say is that um, we also don't know the true level of um, opposition at any given point. Uh, because most people don't walk around every day uh, expressing uh, how they feel today in this moment about the regime. Some people do, <laughs> um, but most people, so in key moments of crisis, um, many people are often surprised by how many people turn out uh, in opposition to a regime um, in a way that seems surprising and unexpected. Um, but then in retrospect, people say was inevitable. So, for example, um, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Sudan, uh, a year and a half ago, these are regimes that had been in power for decades. Uh, and, um, you know, Sudan in particular uh, was uh, a regime that had been in power for 30 years and was led by someone who had committed genocide um, against part of the population and um, among many other crimes. And then all of a sudden, we discovered, um, you know, the world discovered that his regime was far more fragile than anyone knew um, because of a people power challenge that uh, grew in size and in force uh, over the course of a few months, despite the fact that there were brutal crackdowns throughout the entire period. So the answer is we don't know, um, but uh, we, uh, there, there are reasons to, uh, to not believe the lie that all regimes are immutable uh, and permanent and invulnerable. Usted mencionó antes las distintas estrategias para debilitar a una dictadura desde adentro, pero ¿cómo se puede lograr esto cuando el régimen se siente amenazado por un proceso de cambio? ¿Cómo se llega a ese momento en que el ejército y la policía deciden que ya no pueden seguir reprimiendo? It's a good question, and it's hard to know exactly. Again, in each case, there are differences. Um, but generally speaking, there are two things that come to mind. The first is um, a movement that grows in its size and in its diversity is more likely than uh, to create situations where there are direct social connections between the participants and uh, members of the police or, or military and that those personal connections begin to matter, um, especially as they grow in number. Um, the second uh, thing I would say about it is that um, sometimes it's the case that the police and security forces never defect um, for one reason or another. They're simply too committed to the regime uh, to ever defect. This was the case in South Africa during the anti-apartheid struggle, for example, the, the security forces um, we're never going to defect to the black townships. So instead, that movement, uh, the anti-apartheid movement, focused pressure on economic and business elites in order to um, put pressure through them on the government to change. And in that context, um, that was really the fundamental pillar um, whose cooperation uh, made the difference. So I think um, it depends on each place. Um, sometimes 
active confrontations with police and security forces is very dangerous and too risky as it was in South Africa. And so it's unwise sort of um, for movements to focus on that pillar. Los regímenes autoritarios usualmente descalifican la resistencia civil como una conspiración financiada desde el exterior, desde Estados Unidos o desde la Unión Europea y la llaman una especie de golpe suave. ¿Se puede importar o exportar la resistencia civil desde afuera? No, definitely not. Um, certainly there's evidence of, um, of uh, cases where there was uh, attempts to try to actively support nonviolent movements, um, and usually it backfires badly um, because basically it makes the movement unable to claim local roots and local legitimacy. But actually, uh, these forms of support are, um, are m much less direct uh, than is commonly cited by, um, by many authoritarian regimes. And it is uh, almost a universal pattern for authoritarian regimes to blame outsiders for their own domestic struggles um, as a way to try to deflect from the core issues and delegitimize the campaign. So um, the fact that it's a universal uh, pattern, uh, that it doesn't matter whether you're talking about Turkey, Russia, Venezuela, or Donald Trump, the fact that all of these leaders say that it's you know, outsiders who are the cause of their problems um, rather than uh, their own kind of domestic conflicts um, shows that it's probably not a very credible claim. ¿Qué relación existe entre las protestas nacionales y la presión externa y las sanciones internacionales para aislar a una dictadura? Al menos en el caso de Venezuela y Nicaragua, pareciera que algunos sectores que están presionados por la represión esperarían una solución política proveniente del extranjero. Yeah, there, uh, I don't think there's too much evidence to suggest that, um, that first of all, there are... Um, international actors who are in a position to effectively um, do anything that would help uh, a, a civil conflict. Um, I think also there are strong um, reasons morally uh, why international actors should not um, kind of posture themselves as imperialists trying to manage the affairs of other states. Um, and that's especially true when it comes to the United States, which has overreached in this way so many times, um, causing much destruction and death, <laughs> devastation um, as a result. And so um, civil resistance campaigns are fundamentally about um, domestic uh, people power movements that are trying to uh, help to solve real political problems that are affecting people's lives and livelihoods. Uh, and uh, therefore should be managed largely internally, in, in my opinion. ¿Qué puede aprender el movimiento de resistencia civil de Nicaragua de los ejemplos de otros países, como por ejemplo Hong Kong, Líbano, Bolivia, Puerto Rico, más recientemente Bielorrusia, o de otros ejemplos históricos? We have hundreds and hundreds of examples from around the world of, uh, of civil resistance movements that aren't very familiar because their stories haven't been told. <laughs> And their stories haven't been told in part because, um, because people pay much less attention uh, to episodes where people power movements use nonviolent methods to overturn unjust systems um, than they do to pay attention to violent uh, revolutions um, that fire the imagination uh, and that um, hold up heroes um, in, in, our, in our societies, I'm speaking as an American uh, in the U.S. here about the, the sort of mythology of the American Revolution um, as being kind of a, a key point in our history that was so defining, um, but downplaying all of the incredibly important moments in U.S. history um, that led to um, the end of slavery, that ended to, you know, the end of, of uh, women's repression and, and, you know, women achieving the right to vote themselves, and many other cases where what we know is that um, uh, movements that, that appeal to a larger and larger number of people because they uh, convince them that it's in their interest to work with the movement, um, the, that rely on nonviolent methods, that stick to their own plan, um, even as repression escalates against them, um, and uh, are able to, to coordinate or, 
a, a creative set of, of methods of nonviolent resistance tend to be more likely to succeed. That doesn't mean they always succeed, but very few progressive changes have ever happened without a civil resistance movement. In Nicaragua, más allá del estado policíaco en que vivimos, la pandemia del COVID-19 ha impuesto una restricción adicional para la movilización de los ciudadanos. Por un lado, el manejo negligente de la pandemia ha afectado la credibilidad del gobierno y el apoyo de sus propios seguidores. Pero por el otro lado, los movimientos de oposición no han logrado llenar ese vacío de poder. ¿Cómo pueden los movimientos de resistencia civil resolver ese estancamiento? Um, and it's true in many places around the world um, right now. And I think that one of the most interesting things that's happened during this time is the innovation of new tactics that allow people to engage in various forms of socially distant or physically distant protest and, and resistance. Um, so this includes, um, you know, many different types of car caravan protests or um, casserole protests when people are banging pots and pans inside their homes. It's a way to sort of help to build uh, a sense of solidarity and unity during this time. Uh, and many movements around the world are indeed using this time to essentially regroup, strategize, come up with plans for what's next. Um, the average nonviolent campaign takes about three years to run its course. And many movements around the world are not prepared for three year struggles when they start out. Um, but moments like this where um, things like active street protests um, aren't as available safely to people can serve as an opportunity uh, to regroup and re-engage and begin to build those relationships and coalitions that, that are so important later. Usted mencionó previamente que el éxito de los movimientos de resistencia civil puede o no estar relacionado con la existencia de líderes nacionales. ¿Cuáles son los roles que pueden jugar estos líderes? Well, um, leaders are important as communicators, um, both internally within the movement and externally with the public with whom they're trying to have a conversation. And uh, so, uh, you know, the question is how a movement structures its leadership and, um, and whether it is uh, open to having uh, what many feminist scholars call leaderful resistance, which is to say a, a number of people who um, who are able to uh, captivate the attention of the public and, and of the movement and are accountable to that movement and how they behave and what they say. Uh, and that can really help a movement to navigate um, or has helped movements to navigate uh, different uh, periods of stress and distress and repression um, and, in a way that's made them more effective in the long run. Eso es lo que dice la investigadora de la Universidad de Harvard, Enika Chenoweth, sobre el tema de mayor relevancia para debatir el futuro de Nicaragua. ¿Cuáles son las estrategias que debería emprender el Movimiento Azul y Blanco de Resistencia Civil para debilitar al régimen Ortega Murillo, sumar fuerzas y desmantelar la dictadura para iniciar la reconstrucción democrática del país? Sí.